This is Radar from the Radar Table, coming at you with another edition of MLB Observations Hot Stuff Edition Week 17, ending last year's 2023 season, going into this year's 2024 season. Spring training is underway, but there's still a hot stove out there with key free agents like Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, Matt Chapman, and J.D. Martinez, amongst other players out there. There's a lot of other players out there like Michael Lorenzen and Johnny Cueto, just to name some, and Elvis Andrus, and... um. You know, just a few other guys out there that could help teams out. Now let's get to the news. The White Sox have acquired Peyton Burdick off waivers. This dude has gone from Miami, I think, to Baltimore to the White Sox. The White Sox feel like he's not going to cost a lot, but they're really hoping that Dominic Fletcher will be the everyday right fielder. And I personally hope that the likes of Kevin Pillar and Brett Phillips play on the Sox this year, not just as a greediness because I like them and one is a Jew like myself, but the clubhouse presence the two of them bring would be good. But Sox just a game getting depth in the outfield, which is kind of an issue when Robert gets hurt or they don't have a right fielder. Reds have signed Mike Ford a minor league deal. Again, the Reds paid all that money for Candelario and let the likes of Nick Senzel and Joey Votto go and are having Spencer Sear play left field. How many corner infield guys who should be playing the corner infield or playing or being the DH are the Reds going to have? I don't see Mike Ford playing any games for the Reds unless there's a lot of injuries. He's the type of guy you want a team that doesn't have an everyday first baseman or DH possibility. The Diamondbacks have signed Kyle Garlick and Alberto Moore to minor league deals. Again, there's a reason why Dominic Fletcher was traded to the White Sox. They saw that between McCarthy and Thomas as their center fielder slash fourth outfielder and the production that Guriel and Jock can give in left field and DH and, of course, the reigning rookie of the year, Corbin Carroll, and they still have Pavin Smith as the DH first base candidate. Like They need, they don't have enough they don't have enough room for outfielders. So Kyle Garlick is, again, a bat first, first baseman DH who's bat playing the outfield. Alberto Moore is a really good defensive outfielder, but he can't hit. So they're going to be triple-A depth because, again, between Pavin Smith and Jake McCarthy and Jock Peterson, that's three backup outfielders right there on your 40-man roster. You're never going to use these guys. Phillies have signed Cam Gallagher to a minor league deal. Again, when you got one of the best catchers in all baseball, J.T. Ramuto, and a great backup in Garrett Stubbs who could be starting elsewhere, Cam Gallagher is just insurance in case of an injury. Francisco Mesquia was cut by the Angels, and I knew the Angels with Logan Ohapi and Matt Tice, just to name two catchers, there's no room for this guy. So it's obvious he knew he was going to make the team. The Mets have got Colton Ingram or additional depth. Bad news, Tristan Beck has a hand injury. And now the news today is he's going to go surgery for an aneurysm in his arm. So hopefully he's better. Um, Bailey Horn has been traded to the White Sox for Matt Thompson. The Cubs needed to clear a roster spot on the 40-man roster for Cody Bellinger. Bailey Horn was originally sent to the Cubs in the Ryan Tapera trade. So the White Sox get a reliever they're familiar with and give up some other guy. Uh, Carlos Hernandez is dealing with shoulder soreness. It's not good for him. White Sox can't catch a break. First, the Rule 5 guy has Tommy John surgery. Davis Martin, Martin Davis had Tommy John surgery last year. And I could and I can swear that there's been at least one, maybe two other Sox pitchers between the end of last season, like in, no, in November through February, right now, through now we're in March, that I think the Sox have now had three or four guys announced having Tommy John surgery. And I knew that Jesse Schulten's one's not going to be in the rotation for the White Sox because they paid money for Fetty and Flexen and got the two Braves pitchers and they signed Chad Cool to Miley deal and they're expecting Crochet to start. And Tuki Tucson is still on the four-man roster. That Schulten was probably not going to be in the five-man rotation, but he would have been in a key important long relief guide for the White Sox. But nope, out for this year. I don't know if the Sox are going to keep him next year. Carlos DFA'd Buddy Kennedy. And the Tigers picked him up, and they DFA their own Andre Lipschitz. I'm not sure if this is the guy who is his first career home run, and I was right in the section that caught it. Not sure about that. Uh, Jason Alexander, happy birthday to you. Not George Costanza or Britney Spears Association, but the Brewers pitcher has signed a minor deal with the Red Sox pretty much this past week, so it's a good birthday present. Red Sox can use all the pitching depth they can get. Mason Thompson, Tommy John surgery. Sucks to see another pitcher in baseball going through that. Padres assigned Tim LaCastro to a minor league deal. And that's a good move for them because literally they traded two-thirds of the outfield in Trent Grisham and Juan Soto. They they kept Jerks and Profar. And they have Fernando Tatis Jr. in the corner spots. But there's no one screaming. Oscar Machado, El Zocar, those guys are not screaming, if I pronounce his name right, are not screaming everyday guys. No, it's Tim LaCastro, but again... You don't have a center fielder. You just sign guys to minor league deals. Matt Brass is having arm issues, and so is Gregory Santos, so not good for Seattle. Trevor Steven is dealing with an elbow injury. That's not good for him. The Mets have signed John 
Duplantier to Miley Deal, the former Diamondback starting pitcher. Again, organizational debt. That's not the move I thought the Mets were going to do with the news of Sangai being injured, but it is what it is. Mets also said that Mass Karnacek is going to start the year on the injured list. So, again, more pitching problems. Like, again, Trevor Bauer's out there. I don't think they want to spend all that money on Montgomery or Snell, but I just mentioned, like, Johnny Cueto and, like, Michael Lorenzo are out there. Come on, Mets. You need some pitching depth there. The Yankees have DFA Jordan Groshans to get Jemai Jones because the Yankees are looking for a guy who has outfield and infield experience, and they were trying to sign Kiki Hernandez, but obviously the Dodgers signed him the other day, the other day so the other week so or for a one year four million dollar deal to go back to the team so the Yankees are like we need an infield outfielder because between Cabrera and Peraza we got utility guys but we kind of need a guy who can do both because Trent Grisham is entrenched as a fourth outfielder so they got the everyday outfield fine uh, Sam Hilliard, who I was saying, maybe he'll be the Orioles' backup outfielder. But I'm looking at the Orioles' roster, and I counted four center fielders between McKenna and Kowser, and there's a and there's like a Kowser and a Colson, and then this guy's name I can't pronounce. So that was like completely dead wrong about that. But the Rockies picked him back up, and again, the Rockies are have the guys like Togaila and Nolan Jones and Chris Bryant have been playing games in the outfield, and what do they all in common? Not outfit that's your infielder, corner infielder, DH. It. So it's just they're familiar with him. Yes, he was with Atlanta last year, but they're he's essentially only been a Rocky for the most part. So that will help them out because, again, they don't have a center fielder and they also don't have a great outfielders in terms of defense. Baseball players have been complaining about their jerseys ripping easily, them being too tight, the lettering font being too tiny and weird, that they're that not just they're tighter, but they also have see throughs to the something that have had that to cover their junk when doing it. I don't know what's going on with Major League Baseball and their jerseys with the people making them now, but that's something they're going to have to worry some. Matt Kemp has been hired to be in an advisor role for Los Angeles Dodgers, so any attempt of him being back in any form of baseball is over with being that. Cubs have brought back Cody Bellinger on a three-year $80 million deal with 30 this year, and he's opt-out. Again, the Cubs had Patrick Wisdom, Chris Fermorell, and they got Michael Bush from the Dodgers. I don't know. They got lucky in that. What do all three of those comments? They're bad first players who have no actual home to play a position. The Cubs have also multiple first basemen between Mervis and I think Young on the roster. And again, Seiya Suzuki and Ian Happer entrenched in the corners. And they got one of the top prospects in baseball, Precor Armstrong, in center field. And they just signed Dom Smith and Garrett Cooper to minor league deals. And they just signed uh, David Peralta to minor league deals. So I'm like, like Bellinger is great for the lineup. He's not going to DH because, again, they got too many guys who are bad first guys. He's probably not going to play first base because they're stupidly saying Michael Bush, who's not a first baseman, he's like a second baseman, third baseman. Oh, he'll, he'll play first base. Uh, Wisdom will play some games at first base. And instead of letting P. Cor Armstrong, who's a really good defensive center fielder, play alongside Gold Glover Ian Happ and Gold Glover Calvin right field, say Suzuki, we're going to throw Bellinger in the outfield. And I'm going to say, people are like, Bellinger's going to outfield, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, he's a very good, useful player who has played outfield and first base in DH. But I still think he's one of, if he plays first base every day, he's healthy and has the year he had last year. So I won the best first baseman. Kind of gets crowded in the center field market with Julio Rodriguez, Luis Robert, and some other guys. But again, this helps the Cubs lineup and their clubhouse. And if they're serious about making the playoffs, he's the type of move you make to fix your lineup. I still think they should have kept Candelario after trading for him at third base because that would have given them a clear third baseman. But that's just me. Uh, Garrett Cooper, as I mentioned, signed a money deal with the Cubs. Nick Ahmed signed a minor deal with San Francisco, while Brandon Crawford is going to the Cardinals. This is confusing because if the Cardinals were looking for a veteran guy, I don't know if Brandon Crawford would have taken a minor league deal like Nick Ahmed because Nick Ahmed has been an everyday shortstop it's most, for most of his career in Arizona. has been a gold glove shortstop, but the Giants are going with a rookie shortstop. Tyrus Strike second base. They got two third basemen. They got multiple first basemen. So they just need some... Veteran depth in case, you know, the rookie's not good enough for those injuries, and that's a good move for Nick Ahmed. He goes from a team that was a playoff team that went to the World Series last year. He wasn't on the roster. I think they cut him at some point and DFA'd him, but the Giants are an average team, so I can see playing time for him in case of injuries or performance. For for uh, Brandon Crawford, again, the Cardinals were so loaded at shortstop that they're having a rookie play shortstop, and Tommy Edmond can't play second base because they got two second basemen, and Tom... Go, 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 Nolan Gorman and Brandon Donovan, and they got Al Burleson. 
Jordan Walker, and they got obviously the set Goldsmith and Arenado in the corner infield, and they got Contreras behind the plate, and they still got Dylan Carlson. So Tommy Edmond, who most likely would have been their everyday shortstop, is playing center field. So I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, if they're going to be fully committed to a shortstop and they still have Tommy Edmond, like, what do they need Brandon Crawford for? I don't know. But it'll be a good influence on the team that just had a horrible season and, and was se- second to last place and didn't make the playoff to have a Gold Glove World Series championship shortstop. That's good for the clubhouse. While Manuel Margot, who was traded in the Tyler Glass now trade in Los Angeles, has been traded with infielder R- R- Ryan Rain Duncan and cast the Twins for Noah Miller. The Dodgers apparently needed a four-man roster spot because they'd rather have Kiki Hernandez to fill in for Hayward and Teoscar Hernandez and Chris Taylor and Altman in the outfield and then fill in for Mookie, Gavin Lux, or Miguel Rojas and Muncie and the occasional silly start at first base, which he's done. Okay, cool. They, I thought by getting Ramo or Margot to be in an outfield platoon system with Teoscar Hernandez and Jason Hayward and Chris Taylor, that would have been a very good system. But they apparently want Kiki Hernandez back Gave him like $4 million to do that. And so Manuel Margot was the odd man out. But they're like, hey, Minnesota, you can get money and an infielder for just some guy named Noah Miller so we can clear roster spots for Kiki Hernandez. This helps the Twins out. The Twins win this trade because you get two players in cash for some random guy. The Twins weren't sure between Larnick and Walner what was going to be the everyday left field situation. Because center field with Buxton and Kepler, that's that's set. Set in stone. Carl Santana and Killer and Killer off, kill off at first base and the ace, that's set. So Margot settles in as the potential everyday left fielder and a guy who can play all three outfield spots in case of injury. The Twins get another bat in their lineup. He's, he, had a, he struggled a little bit last year, but again, he's, a very good def, he's been a very good defensive player. Even if he's average with his average speed and his average bat, the Twins have enough offense on their team that just adding another average player to their lineup is a good move for them. It really is. Beltron has announced, the, the Mets announced that Carlos Beltron is like a special advisor to the front office and instructor or whatever. They want him, they're going to have him be on the bench every day. I'm happy with Carlos Beltron because he was supposed to be the manager in 2020. Remember, they gave it to Rojas instead. Carlos Mendoza has never been a major league manager. He's been a bench coach for a while, blah, 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 blah. So having a guy like Beltron, who was supposed to be the manager, who's worked for other teams in, in, in advisory instructor roles, front office roles, and he's a Hall of Fame caliber baseball player who should be in the Hall of Fame, don't care that his last year he was on the Astros scandal team. That was the last year. It doesn't really matter. That it's good that he's getting himself back into baseball in a way where he's not just consulting or instructing. He's going to be on the bench every day, interacting with the players. And maybe that'll help the Mets stop winning what they did two years ago, like 100 games and collapse in the playoffs. Or, th- or last year just completely collapsed as well. That it might be very good for this clubhouse to have a vocal leadership from Carlos Beltran. Okay? The greatest center fielder in Mets history should be able to work in baseball, and this will really help them out. They're trying to get David Wright to do the same thing, which would be pretty cool. Uh, Matt Barnes, I might do the Nationals. And again, the Nationals are a last place team, but they've been just signing guys right and left, starters, relievers, position players, mostly like outfielder, first base, DH, sometimes some middle infielders, corner fielders, because again, they're a bad team. If guys make the roster and they perform well enough, guess what? They can be traded for prospects. That's a good idea. Sad news report, Eric Swanson's son was hit by a car. He's going to be away from the team for a while. He's in, the, he's in the hospital, so prayers up for that situation. Julio Tehran and Colton Wong's on mild deal with the Orioles. I like that move because, as I mentioned with the Orioles, they're pretty set in the outfield. But they're not sure between Jordan Westberg and Urias who's going to play second base and who's going to play third base. And between Mateo and Gunnar Henderson, if they're going to have Gunnar play shortstop to start the season. My thing wearing this Orioles hat today is the message to them. Gunnar Henderson, stay, keep him at third base. Because at some point, Jackson Holiday is going to come up and just needs to take over shortstop. You don't want to shift him over and do this part-time third base a couple days a week and part-time shortstop. No, no, no. Keep him at third base. And as utility guy Urias and youngster Jordan Westberg split the reps second base. So Colton Wong, though, doesn't have a clear path. But again, if Westberg struggles, gets hurt, there's a possibility for Colton Wong. Already with Kyle Bradish being announced he's hurt and Jonathan Means behind schedule from his offseason getting ramped up for the season, that's a good organizational depth move. Tehran was really good for the Tehran was good for the Brewers last year when they needed pitching. That's like a good move for them. That's good organizational decision there. While Francisco Mejia, you mentioned the Angels cut him, the Rays picked him back up. Because the Rays really liked this young no name catcher Renee Pinto for his defense, his his calling a game, all of that. 
They also got Alec Jackson, who used to be a former top prospect, and he's bounced around the league on a non-roster invite with veteran Rob Brantley. So they're like, those two don't really excite us. There's no guarantee that Mejia's going to all of a sudden go back to being that amazing hitting prospect with San Diego and Cleveland because he's never been a great catcher. But if he does, if he's just slightly better than Alex Jackson or Rob Brantley, him and Pinto as a platoon system is, is, is not bad. You can even DH him, Dames, because again, Tampa Bay doesn't have a, an actual real DH. So that's a good move there. And lastly, the Red Sox signed C.J. Crone to my only deal. So the hope is Jaron Duran is an everyday center fielder and Tristan Costa is at first base. That's settled. We obviously have Devers to settle on the third base and they're paying Trevor Story a lot of money to play shortstop. Second base, they got Vaughn Grisham. Okay, cool. They traded for Tyler O'Neill. By trading for Tyler O'Neill, he's going to play left field because, again, not a center fielder. Just keep him in left field. And that Yoshida guy, who they're also paying a lot of money to, will be the DH. But then you're like, well, what is C.J. Crone going to do? You could technically put Yoshida or Tyler O'Neill in right field if you really want to just go all offense and not worry about any development of anyone else. But again, there's a clear thing where the Red Sox are kind of questioning what offense production they're going to get in the outfield. So maybe you put Yoshida back in the outfield to get the offense production, and then the DH spot is wide open. So that would be CJ Crone can have opportunity. So at least that kind of makes sense there, okay? It really does in terms of how they're maneuvering things. Now then, I want to say this, sad story, Stacey Wakefield, wife of former Red Sox knuckleball pitcher, World Series champion Tim Wakefield, has passed away less than five months after her husband, Tim Wakefield, passed away. She was 53. The report was, as Kurt Schilling blattered out on the radio or TV, that he had brain cancer. She was also dealing with a cancer herself. And that's really, I like, if their parents are alive, either one of them, their siblings, their cousins, and their children... To lose both of them at this in the same same five month period, both from cancer. What are the odds? It wasn't that he was a great Red Sox pitcher, and his wife was just the wife of him. They were very big in the community with all the charities and things they were running. So, like the whole Boston community is is hurting on that one. Also, cancer's things. Rest in peace to former major league catcher uh, Hector Ortiz, the former Royals and Rangers catcher who was more obviously a backup, but he had been a coach of the Rangers from 2015 to 2020. He was a minor league coach and was named hitting coach in Class A. Then he was manager of Class A and then the hitting coach as well. And then Arizona Looking League. And then he served as Rangers minor league catching coordinator. After being let go from the major staff following the season, Ortiz returned to minor league coaching as a member of the team's development staff until his unfortunate death. He also had managed in Puerto Rico in the Puerto Rican Winter League. And also, when he was in the major league staff, he was the first base coach for three seasons and the bullpen coach for one season. And then he returned another season for a first base coach for the 29th season and then went back to catching in 2020. So rest in peace to Hector Ortiz. Uh, rest in peace to Jose De Leon, the former pitcher has passed away at 63 after also a battle with cancer. The former Pirate White Sox Cardinal Philly Expo pitcher finished with an 86 and 119 record, a 376 ERA, and under six, just under 1,600 strikeouts. He did lead the league in strikeouts one year in 1989, and unfortunately for him, he uh, led the league in losses twice, which is kind of why he has a losing record. But yeah, just rest in peace to Stacey Wakefield, Hector Ortiz, and Jose De Leon. And happy, we're going to end on a happy note. Happy trails to Brandon Dixon, the former Reds, Tiger, and Padres super utility man who had a 224 lifetime average of 22 and 74 RBI. At the age of 32, he's announced he's retired. He was drafted by the Dodgers, traded to the Reds in that three way trade of Todd Frazier. And then he went over to Japan for one season. Happy trails to him on your career. Thanks again for listening to week number 17 of the 2023 end of season to this year's 2024 hot stove edition of the MLB season. For On the Radio Table, I'm Radar. See you guys next time.